That's right. It's time for another economics lesson. And today, we're going to talk about unemployment. Now, in this chapter, we've actually already done some of the toughest topics. GDP is probably the toughest topic to learn about, and we've already mastered that. So from here, we're going to learn about unemployment, and then we're going to talk about some tools that the, uh, the government has at its disposal, and then that'll be at the end of the chapter. So today, a very quick lesson on unemployment. Let's first start off by talking about the labor force. The labor force is the people who are working. And we count the people as working as the number of non-institutionalized, meaning you're not in jail, and you're 16 years or older and you're looking for a job or you have a job. Then you are included in the labor force. So this information is as of May 2015. The United States population was 327 million. We had 164 million people in our labor force. And we had actually 163 million people not in our labor force. So to find our labor force participation rate, you take your labor force, which is this top number, the amount of people who are either working or looking for work, and you divide it by your total population of 327 million, and we found that our labor force participation rate in May 2015 was 50, uh, just about 50%, a little bit over 50.1%. So who do we count as in the labor force, and who do we count as not in the labor force? In the labor force, well, obviously, those are people who are employed. But we also count people who are not employed, people who are unemployed, and people who are looking for work. So if you are looking for work and you don't have a job, you are included in the labor force. Well, who's not included in the labor force? It would be people who aren't looking for work, right? And people uh, like that would include people who are retired and are old and decided they're not going to work anymore. People who are incarcerated and have no choice because they're in jail, so they can't work. Uh, students like you, if you, if you can be counted in the labor force if you're not looking for work, but many students don't look for work, especially in high school and sometimes even in college, depending on your sports and, and your academics, it might not be possible to have a job at the same time. Of course, children, they just can't have a job because no one's really employing a child. Unless you're one of those, like, actors for Disney at, like, the age of four. Sometimes you hear commercials for those kids. I'm like, whoa. That would be intense, like, being told you have to act at a young age. So you are either unwilling or unable to work, and then you're not included in that labor force. So, again, 164 million people included in the labor force in the United States. 163 million not included. So how do we calculate our unemployment rate? Pretty simple. You take your number of unemployed people and divide it by your total labor force. So for example, let's say I have eight people working in my labor force and I have two very sad people who are not. Well, my total labor force is 10 people. I have two unemployed, so it'd be two divided by 10 to give me an unemployment rate of 20%. To change things up, let's knock one of these unemployment people off the board. Go away. Goodbye. Now I have eight employed, one unemployed. So my unemployment would be one divided by a total of nine people. And one divided by nine gives me about an 11% unemployment rate. The labor force doesn't include people who have given up looking for work and people who are in retired. We already discussed that, but if you're retired or you're just straight up not looking for work because you've given up, you look for jobs and you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna take my unemployment checks and just live off that. Not included in the labor force. To be counted as unemployed, a worker must meet these criteria. A worker must be able to work, meaning that they're not disabled and not incarcerated. A worker must be willing to work and actively looking for a job in order to be unemployed. And a worker must not currently be working, so they obviously can't work if they want to count as unemployed. And that includes part-time work. If you are working part-time, like for example a trainer who only works for a few hours a week, you are still counted as employed. 
There are four different types of unemployment that we're going to discuss. The first one is the most common, and it's kind of what's taking place right now. We call it cyclical unemployment, and those are workers who were laid off because of a recession or slow economic growth. So right now, with everyone staying home during the pandemic, we have a lot of people not working and a lot of people laying people off because, well, there's no business right now. So that would be slow economic growth. And there's going to be studies on this pandemic and how it affects the economy. But the last time, the last time we had a lot of unemployment was back in 2008, 2009. And so I just wanted to show you this graphic, which shows from January 2007 onward, just how employment in the United States changed. So the more unemployment, the darker color you're going to get. And as you can see, the month is starting to go through. And so we're in late 2007, and now we're in 2008. And notice we're starting to get some darker colors like purple and red and the dark purple. Now we're in October 2008. That's when things really start hitting. And look how much the country changes into those darker colors. So that by 2009, all the populated areas of the country are now in high 10% or above unemployment. And by the time it ends in February 2011, which is right now, 10% unemployment is pretty common throughout the country, except if you're one of these middle states like Kansas, because you always need corn growers in Kansas. And the fact is, well, no one in California or New York or in Florida wants to move to Kansas to find a corn farmer job because those are boring. But high unemployment everywhere else. So that's what happened last time. Hopefully that doesn't happen this time, but we've already seen a rise in unemployment due to this pandemic. The second type of unemployment is structural unemployment. That's where you're unemployed because you lack the necessary skills that producers desire. An example of that would be like, let's say you work for a car manufacturing plant. That car manufacturing plant shuts down. You have skills as a mechanic in a car manufacturer, but there are no other car manufacturers in the area that are hiring. Therefore, the skills that you have do not meet the other skills that people are looking for. You are structurally unemployed. Frictional unemployment is a temporary joblessness that can usually go along with something like a life event, for example, graduation. So you graduate from college, you look for a job, well, usually you can't find one right away. You're lucky if you can. Get those internships in college. If you can't find a job right away, cool, but if you can't, you're in frictional unemployment. And the last type of unemployment is seasonal unemployment, like our summer lifeguards. Especially in states where it's like cold during the winter, not like California, and people still go to the beach, but in states like the Midwest, where they have pools and water parks, well, those lifeguards, they don't need them during the winter months. So that would be seasonal unemployment. If we take a look at unemployment from 1960 through 2019, we'll see that it peaks and goes down. So it has its peaks, it has its troughs. The last time we had major unemployment was during the Great Recession, 2008-2009. Hopefully we don't get there next. That's it for unemployment, actually. I'm going to briefly talk about inflation real quick in here because, as we noted at the beginning of the chapter, there are three economic indicators that economists look to to judge how well the economy is doing. And so we look at our total output growth, which is GDP, which was the last lesson. We look at how many people are employed, and that's unemployment in this lesson. And we also look at our prices being kept stable, which is all about inflation. Now, we're actually not going to have a lesson on inflation because we're going to cover inflation in much more detail next chapter. So we're just going to leave inflation as what was said in the very first section of notes. And our last notes that we're going to go on to in the next video for the next assignment is going to be how do we achieve our national economic goals? So take a look at the assignment, post it with unemployment, and work on that. For now, that's me signing off. It's been great talking to you today about economics. Join us next time for an invigorating lesson on achieving national economics.